This is One on One. I'm Adeline Jones. Robots and intelligent computers have captured the imagination of many generations with memorable characters such as the Terminator, Hal, and the cute one, R2-D2. Then, too, there are the robots who gang up and revolt and try to take over the world. Will robots one day take over the world or, heaven forbid, replace us? Here to separate the real science of artificial machine intelligence from our imaginations is my guest, Doug Fisher, Associate Professor of Computer Science and Computer Engineering at Vanderbilt University. I asked him first to give us a definition of artificial intelligence. Oh, there's lots of ways to define artificial intelligence. I mean, to some extent, it's just AI is as AI does. But, um, you know, one definition that a lot of people um, would uh, believe is that um, artificial intelligence is the study and creation of computer programs that do what we would regard as intelligent if we saw them in humans or, or other animals. So by intelligent, do you mean as if they can think, as if they can figure things out? As if they can figure things out. And, and many artificial intelligence programs are concerned with looking and evaluating alternatives, and that's to some extent what characterizes an AI program. And I'll use the expression AI, artificial intelligence. You'll, I'll slip back and forth there. But um, they have the capability of, of evaluating alternatives. What are some of the applications today in use and some of the applications that are being uh, worked on? Well, some of the applications that are in use, um, there's applications in the military and medicine and transportation. Medical applications include medical expert systems that can, that can uh, diagnose disease, suggest lab tests to be performed and evaluate uh, and predict what, what the disease of a patient is, what the condition is. Other medical applications are, are robotic assistants that help in surgery. Um, military applications include um, planners and schedulers that can, can schedule activities and maneuvers. NASA has a scheduler that it can, it can use for maneuvering spacecraft semi-autonomously. There's certainly game-playing applications. Many people have heard of Deep Blue, the first chess-playing program to beat a champion, a world champion. There's championship backgammon players and AI players. Does a scientist have to go about getting all the possibilities and then programming that into this computer? Is that how it works, that it can come up to be appear to be thinking? Typically, no. Um, <laughs> the scientist has to think about a number of possibilities and think about... Most people are familiar with when they, when they took English in school, the idea of a grammar, what it means to be a legal English sentence. We don't have to teach people all the possible legal English sentences in school, but we have to teach them the grammar that they can use to piece together legal English sentences. And a scientist has to look at enough situations, enough possibilities, so that they can get and extract something like this idea of a grammar that the program can use to create and assess and simulate situations that it, it hasn't explicitly seen. What are the potential drawbacks or fallbacks of this system other than the obvious, like the system crashes or, you know, some sort of technical malfunction? Well, one, it could be wrong. It could be wrong. There are systems out there that can outperform most humans at what they do, computer systems that can outperform most humans. Um, there are diagnostic systems that are, that are very good at what they do, including a medical diagnosis. And so there's an argument, well, if they're, if they're right, as, as much or more than, than human experts might be, um, why not use them? And to some extent, there's, there's, there might be legal issues involved in there. Who do you hold responsible if the, if the computer's wrong? So that's, I mean, that's, that's one complication in using artificially intelligent systems versus a human. If the human does something wrong, you, you know who's responsible. Right. If an artificially intelligent system does something wrong and it's, it's right more than it's more than its human counterparts, can you really blame it? But you've got to hold something responsible. Who do you hold responsible? What are you working on currently at Vanderbilt? Personally, I'm, I'm working on um, looking for patterns in uh, physiological data to predict uh, outcomes in cancer. Um, I'm also working on a project that's involved in creating personal assistance for um, uh, military personnel in the field to consider and rank various, um, various tactical options. There are applications like that that are, that are currently fielded. Other work at Vanderbilt includes uh, tutoring systems, systems that will help students 
through a, uh, a math problem and give hints in the case where the student gets stuck. There is uh, work on uh, combining graphics with um, artificial intelligence. You have a large library of, of cartoons, say Bugs Bunny cartoons. And from this large library, you'd like to create um, novel cartoons by piecing together um, frames from uh, older cartoons and, 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 and resequencing them into new cartoons. So that's a, an interesting <laughs> application. What are, what are some of the things that are in their infancy? Wow. So much as if in its infancy. I, it's hard for me to project too much into the future. There are vehicles now that uh, can drive autonomously the vast majority of the time. You can put an intelligent vehicle, certain intelligent uh, specialized vehicles on, on a highway, and, and they can drive without, for the most part, without assistance. There's a camera attached, and they can take visual cues and decide when other cars are, are getting too close. That work you, you might regard as um, the very beginnings of uh, the idea of an intelligent highway, in which um, cars on the highway are driving autonomously and communicating with each other, coordinating their efforts to um, maintain optimal flow, to avoid traffic jams, to avoid getting too close, to avoid uh, accidents, to maximize collective fuel consumption things like that. Are there as many desires for what these things can do as, as there are people, or do you find a consensus am, among people that are making these machines that would say, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could all do this, like sort of aiming in the same direction or the same directions in general? There are so many different directions uh, for this technology. Whatever kinds of tasks people perform in support of other activities. You will find people interested in, in introducing artificially intelligent systems that might be capable of the same kind of support tasks or certain kind of support tasks. It might be interesting to have a, um, you know, a, a diabetic personal assistant. We might imagine personal assistants that are being created and um, a diabetic personal assistant might take your insulin levels and your glucose levels and understand what you ate that morning and what you need to do to bring your uh, glucose levels down, how much insulin you need to take, for example. Right now, there's, there's technology out there. If I, go to, if I go to one of the big booksellers online and I buy a book, many people are familiar with the idea of getting suggestions for other books. We might imagine in, in the, actually, probably the, the near term that we have those kinds of recommender systems that go across application lines. So, for example, if I'm reading, if, if my web browser is intelligent and is looking to see what I'm reading, and I'm reading a lot of articles on global warming, for example, uh, and there happens to come out a movie, on, a science fiction movie on the results of global warming, my artificially intelligent personal assistant might recommend, well, you know, Doug, I've, I've noticed that you've been watching, <laughs> you've been reading a lot of articles on global warming. Here's a movie that just came out on it. Do you want to see that? And this time it'll be able to tell you rather than just, you know, reading it on the, on the email or the... Presumably it could tell you. Yes, it could, it could, it could tell you. Well, that gets us into the uh, how human-like can these things ever become? It will be relatively easy, I think, to make them appear human-like. It's one thing for a artificial intelligence system to appear human. It's quite another thing for it to actually simulate very closely human responses. For example, it's, it's easy for an artificial intelligence—it might be easy for an artificial intelligence system to— pretend to be sad or to pretend to be happy or to pretend to be empathetic. Um, it's maybe relatively easy for a artificial intelligence system to sense sadness in you, but it is probably very, very difficult to actually create an artificial intelligence system that is sad. That is, that is something that's even the most optimistic of us think is in the very, very, very long term. But um, yes, I think, it's, I think it's, it will be relatively easy for uh, people to think that these artificial intelligence systems are, are acting human. There seems to be, if you're trying to program these systems to pick up your emotion, your sadness, your anger, or happiness, or whatever, and respond to it, or be like-minded, there's something phony about that. I mean, there's something that feels like a, mm -hmm. a deception. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's right. It's... Um, these systems that um, we create that in some sense are not really empathetic but um, are appearing to be, um, we could probably talk to philosophers about this and they would suggest that this, this, is, 
this is impacting our views of, of what it means to be a person. And it could lead to uh, a disillusion when we discover that these systems that um, appear to feel um, for us uh, don't really feel for us at all. And we could probably point to a, a whole bunch of science fiction movies in which that was exactly the theme. So why is that then one of the goals? One might imagine that uh, in the case of, say, a helper robot, a robot that's, that's helping somebody that's sick, it might be desirable for them uh, to uh, sense the emotional state so that um, a physician or a nurse could be contacted, a human could be contacted. This, this is an application that I would see as, as a good one. If the machine that's interacting with the robot that's interacting with the, the human can sense emotions, perhaps it can, it can give a heads up to a, a human that could come in and give comfort, for example. You're saying that the computers, or we're talking about these, or this artificial intelligence being able to perceive human emotion and possibly mimic right. it. How, how, how is that programmed into the system? There can be a couple different ways. I mean, one effort at MIT, I think, is looking at vision, uh, recognizing facial cues from humans, whether the uh, cheeks are pinched and the eyes are squinted and um, the face is red. That would be one input in which you could a, a, a machine could be programmed to or, or learn what the emotions behind those those features were. Um, work at Vanderbilt is looking at um, physiological cues, sweat, temperature, um, things like that, sensing physiological cues and trying to learn what the emotions underlying those those physiological patterns are. So those are two ways that you could program a computer to identify emotion or also learn to identify emotion based on feedback. When it l learns, does it just sort of put uh, two and two together or, or, or add something on that wasn't originally added and then say, okay, this belongs to the anger category, for example? It has to be told in some sense what it is trying to learn. It has to, it has to receive some feedback from a trainer. It might be a human trainer. It might be another machine trainer. So, for example, based <laughs> on... Uh, you could have your, your computer look at an image of a human face and then have a human trainer say, this face represents anger. And the human trainer could show a number of faces that represented anger. And from that, the computer could extract the features that seem to be common to the angry faces. What about voices? What about hearing any of the sounds? The, the feedback could be indirect. If, for example, the computer knew that uh, a loud voice in a certain tone was represented anger. And if the computer was, uh, you know, working the help window at the uh, Department of <laughs> Motor Vehicles, um, the computer could could learn that uh, yelling associated with these faces represented some kind of common class of behavior that it would later learn to be anger. So the learning has to come with some kind of feedback. You would have to know in that case that a loud voice represented anger before it could learn that the facial cues that accompanied a loud voice represented anger as well. What does it learn as its proper response? Like like in that scenario you described, what if it's getting yelled uh, at? Does it learn to duck? Does it learn to uh, well, this is, <laughs> just sit there and take it? Does it learn? What does it learn to do? I think machines are very good at sitting there and taking <laughs> it. I, that's, that's what I'd, I'd suggest. The responding to somebody's anger could be as important as uh, any of the rest of it, understanding it in the very first place. So if you have this machine that just stands there while you're angry and not giving you any kind mm -hmm. of interaction, that actually could exacerbate the situation. It could. Or someone who's in deep grief, and then you have this right. thing just sitting there. I think Who you're right. It, it, it is, if you're going to have a computer that can sense emotion, you want it to respond appropriately what an appropriate response is, though, in that situation is, is not something that I, I could necessarily know. But there was an example earlier where we talked about um, a robot sensing um, sadness or concern or a patient that was frantic and, and calling for human help. I mean, that's the situation that the response in that case would be call for human help. And that might be the case of the, um, in the situation where the robot is sensing um, somebody that's angry. Get me a human being. Hopefully one who can deal with it. Hopefully one that can deal with it. But, you know, what, one interesting question. I mean, it is very easy for computers to sense emotion. I think we've talked about that before, but um, that doesn't mean they feel emotion. 
They can identify emotion in others, in humans, but that doesn't mean they feel emotion. And a theme that's, that's quite common in science fiction uh, is what happens when, when, if and when we ever do create a human that, or a, um, a, a robot or computer that can feel emotion and that is self-aware, um, that it knows the consequences of its actions and it's aware of its own being. What, what are the rights of such a, an individual? Is that, a, is that a person in a different body? Um, can we just turn it off? Sci- those things are so popular in science fiction, not because I think that people really expect that they're going to come about. I don't as a, I do not expect that to come about in my lifetime, a, a computer that really feels. The but feeling, the, that just seems to go, go beyond the step of just this sort of mimicking, picking up signs. I mean, the feeling is a whole nother, it just feels like a whole nother process that would be impossible to install, but that's my opinion. I think it may be a, a point that we really don't have to face. I cannot imagine building a robot. I mean, why the market would support the building of a robot that really felt. It just does not seem to be a cost-effective thing to do. We have other things that are running around the world that actually feel already. They're called human <laughs> beings, and we don't right, need artificial systems. Right, we had enough systems. trouble with that. That's correct. But they do, they do in science fiction, these, these feeling robots do make very good surrogates for, for other kinds of things. They, <laughs> they allow science fiction writers to talk about things like patient rights without ever bringing in the, the, the emotional baggage that comes with that. They can talk about robots. If you were to compare the uh, intelligent system to the human brain, what are some of the differences and some of the likenesses? I think that there are many differences between the, the human brain and the, uh, the digital computer, which is the hardware in which most artificially intelligent systems are going to run. The biochemical interactions in the brain tend to be much slower, but they're there's massive parallelism that goes on in the brain. Many things are occurring at the same time, and that's where the brain gets its speed. The individual responses are slow compared to that of a digital computer, but so much is happening in parallel that it achieves great speed. So that's one difference. The individual operations in a, in a computer are, are very much faster, but not, a whole, not, not as much goes on in parallel. There are people that actually are at work on creating software programs, computer programs that simulate the brain. That is, they're trying to achieve a close correspondence between the way these programs work and the brain works. And that can be important to, um, for purposes of doing um, experiments. What if we lesion this part of this simulated brain? What would happen? Um, that might give us some insight into what, what happened in a real brain, perhaps. But for many applications, we in artificial intelligence don't really care whether there's a close correspondence between the digital computer and the human brain. We're not really interested in human intelligence. We're interested in one supporting human intelligence, not trying to replace a doctor, but augment the capabilities of a doctor by presenting the doctor with possibilities that, from which the doctor can select some, some things to pursue, uh, that kind of support task. Or we're interested in you know, a kind of alien intelligence, an intelligent computer that can operate on a, on a computer network or a, an operating system. The most far-fetched thing that I think I've heard is people who, and I'm a bit vague on this, but <laughs> are trying to create some kind of a robot that they can then dwell in <laughs> eternally. Download their mind. <laughs> or whatever they're going to do. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I know there are people out there like that. That is so far away that I, I don't even think about it on a yearly basis. But there really are people that are doing something uh, along be- those lines, I aren't believe there? that there are people that are interested in that. Yes, they're interested in downloading their their minds, in essence. To and do you think they're in the, in the fringe? I mean, does anyone actually think that this is, should be a serious, even remote possibility? Most, I think, most serious practitioners of artificial intelligence, the vast majority, would say, "No, that's that's not that's not serious. That's not serious work. That's not a serious expectation." Most of us that work in artificial intelligence are are, are simply interested in more mundane engineering tasks, like creating programs that can operate in support roles, <laughs> like washing the dishes, maybe. Perhaps like <laughs> washing the dishes or vacuuming the floor. That was Doug Fisher, Associate Professor of Computer Science and Computer Engineering at Vanderbilt University. This is Adeline Jones. One-on-one is produced with help from Dan Buckley for Tuned In Broadcasting. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to One-on-One.